there will be trouble. Of course, machines can't think as people do. The machine is different. And thank you so much for coming to Science on Screen presentation of Jurassic World with Jack Horner. Um, and besides thanking all of you, um, we also need to thank the people and organizations who um, made this happen. And so Science on Screen, see I, I wrote this out so I wouldn't forget it. Science on Screen is funded by the Coolidge Corner Foundation and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And this screening is in collaboration with the Children's Museum of Bozeman Steam Lab and the Blunderbuss Science and Maker Fair. And there will be a question and answer session after the movie, and everyone should stay, because it'll be awesome. Um, and of course, the question and answer is with our speaker, Jack Horner. Um, and Jack Horner is arguably the world's most famous paleontologist, and we have him right here in Bozeman. Um, and he actually, yay! Um, he makes a few appearances, cameo appearances in this movie. So he's not just a paleontologist, he's also a movie star. <laughs> um, and he's consultant on all the Jurassic Park movies, and I'm waiting for him to, end, to, to come out here. All right. He's consultant on all the Jurassic Park movies, but he's actually embarked on his own project to re-engineer ancestral dinosaur tra tra traits in a chicken. What does that mean, arguably? Arguably. What does that mean? People argue about it? <laughs> I wouldn't. You are the most famous world <laughs> paleontologist. All right, off I go. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Thanks for coming out. Um, I was asked just to sort of talk about how I got involved in these movies. Um, and it all starts when I was eight years old. Um, well, it probably starts, actually I was probably born this way, but um, when I was eight years old, my, I told my father I was interested in dinosaurs, and he was a gravel guy. He, was, he dug up sand and gravel, and, and, but he had owned a ranch where he remembered seeing some big bones, so he took me out to, so I was born and raised in Shelby, and his ranch was near Dupuyer. Uh, if anybody's ever heard of that, um, took me out there and I wandered around and found my first dinosaur bone. And I had found a lot of fossils around Shelby, clams and snails and animals that lived in the ocean at the time the dinosaurs were wandering around the hills. Um, and so finding that first dinosaur bone was really cool to me. And, and I started digging up my mother's yard, um, looking for more. Um, <laughs> and, and I also started playing with dinosaurs, little toy dinosaurs a lot, and I would make the seaway and I'd make the terrain and, and really got sort of into the whole business of what dinosaurs were like. And of course, back in the 1950s, when I was doing this, the idea of what dinosaurs was like was very different. They were thought of as, you know, big, stupid, green lizards that uh, terrorized one another. Um, and and so, so that was, you know, just like everyone else, I believed that. Um, when I was 13 years old, I discovered my first dinosaur skeleton uh, near Cutbank, and it was used for a science project that I had. And so, and so, I, I was very interested in dinosaurs, and I, I even started a research project when I was in high school. I was interested in why the dinosaurs in Montana were so different than the ones in Alberta when they were supposed to have lived at the same time. Um, I actually never did figure that out. Um, it's a paper that needs to be published someday. Um, but what was interesting was um, I was out looking for fossils mostly because, because I was doing so poorly in school. Um, I had dyslexia. I didn't 
no one knew what dyslexia was. My father thought I was lazy. Um, he couldn't figure out why, you know, why I couldn't pass a grade. Uh, and, and so, so I would make, be making fossil collections for our library and for the school and flunking. And so, so um, making science projects was one thing that I was pretty good at. So I did very well with science projects. And one of those science projects um, won a grand award and I was invited to go to college at Montana State University, Missoula. <laughs> For any of you old enough to know that, when I entered Montana State University, it was in Missoula. They changed the name a year later in 1965. But uh, I got to go to college and I got to, uh, even though I was flunking out, even in college, I was able to study vertebrate paleontology. And, and so I often went back to some of these areas where I'd found some of these dinosaurs. And one of those areas was the Dupourier area. And, and so while I was going to college, I was learning, I, I was flunking out, but I was also learning how to prepare fossils and how to clean them up. And so um, in 1975, I got a job at Princeton University. I, didn't, I never did graduate from college. Um, I took a lot of courses, but I failed them all, so it didn't make any difference. Um, but I got a job at Princeton University and went there and, uh, and took vacations back to Montana and would come out to these sites that I had and look for fossils. And coming back to Dupuyer in 1977, I was lucky enough to find the first dinosaur egg in the Western Hemisphere. As a preparator, don't, no, I don't know what that, that's, that's nothing. <laughs> that's nothing. I didn't know what it was. I thought it actually thought it was a squash turtle. <laughs> um, but a year later, 1978, uh, my friend Bob Mackle and I were back in Montana, and we were looking for juvenile dinosaurs. I had found some evidence that, that juvenile dinosaurs might exist in eastern Montana, Juven no one had ever really gone looking for juvenile dinosaurs because no one thought you could find them. And I, it's a long story why, but it had, to do, had something to do with the difference in the dinosaurs between Montana and Alberta. But I didn't know that, and I still can't figure it out, like I said, so I don't know that it makes any difference at all. But anyway, in 1978, um, I looked in eastern Montana, we didn't find anything, and then I ended up in a rock shop um, identifying a dinosaur for a woman named Marion Brandvold. And as I was leaving her rock shop, she said, oh, by the way, do you know what these little bones are? And of course, they were the first baby dinosaurs. Um, so as a preparator, I published my first paper in the journal uh, Nature, and Princeton University gave me a raise and a promotion to research scientist. And, uh, and then I started publishing papers about dinosaur social behavior, and it was dinosaur social behavior that Michael Crichton picked up on and made a movie or a book called Jurassic Park that Steven Spielberg then turned into a movie, and Steven called me up one day and said, how would you like to work on a movie called Jurassic Park? I hadn't read the book. Um, a friend of mine who had read the book called me up one day and said that I was in it. And of course, I'm dyslexic, so I don't read any books. And I, all the question was, was, the only question I had was whether I was eaten or not. <laughs> Fortunately, I wasn't. So anyway, that's how I ended up working on the Jurassic Park movies. Um, my job was to make sure that the animals were as accurate as they could be based on the science we had at the day. And also, as you all probably know, they aren't accurate and they weren't accurate then. 
by any means. I told Stephen that they needed to have feathers and they needed to be colorful. And he said, feathered, colorful dinosaurs aren't scary enough. <laughs> so even though it was my job to make sure they looked accurate, it was his job to make a good movie. Basically, my job was to sit with Steven Spielberg on set and answer questions. And quite frankly, it's the most boring thing I've ever done. <laughs> I told Steven, I told all of the people who work on Jurassic Park, I wouldn't trade my job for any of their jobs. And I still wouldn't, I, you know. They just do the same thing over and over and over again. <laughs> and what's cool, if you think, so after the movie was done, everybody wanted to come to Montana and see dinosaurs. So you know their job isn't that much fun, <laughs> right? So anyway, Jurassic Park 1, 2, and 3 had animatronics in it, uh, what we call puppets. And, and so I did a lot of work on those. But in Jurassic World, everything is pretty much everything except for one sick, dying, long-necked dinosaur. Everything else is computer graphics, and the computer graphics are fabulous. Um, but I'll let you judge. The one dinosaur in this movie that is accurate, according to me, is Indominus Rex. It is the most accurate dinosaur ever made for the Jurassic Park movies, and it's accurate because I got to design it. <laughs> Have fun, Jurassic World. It was, fun. it was okay to work on the movies, but quite frankly, it was, I thought it was really boring. <laughs> they shoot the same thing over and over and over again, and I don't know, it's, I spent, you know, on Jurassic Park, the first one I spent, I was there for every time they had an animatronic on. And it was just, I just, I just couldn't hardly wait to get back home to look at dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, question out here. Yeah. Jurassic World 2 is being made, yes. It's in the making. <laughs> yes. Will you make another dinosaur for Jurassic World 2? I don't know. <laughs> Can't say too much about Jurassic World 2. <laughs> we made two genetically modified dinosaurs for Jurassic World, but one of them wasn't in the movie. But you could buy it as a toy. It was called Stegoceratops. It was a cross between a Stegosaurus and a Triceratops. But, so, there is a scene in the movie where, where the kids are in the monorail and the youngest boy looks out the window and he's staring at something and it is the Stegoceratops, but we took that out of the movie, so he's just sort of staring into who knows what. <laughs> I found my first dinosaur skeleton um, when I was 13 in the town of Cutbank, Montana. About 20 miles from where I was born and raised. It was a duckbill dinosaur, my favorite kind. No, I was by myself. I was making a science project <laughs> for my high school science project. <laughs> yes? What advice do you have for aspiring geoscientists? Say that again? What advice would you give an aspiring geoscientist? An aspiring geoscientist. Well, it depends on what, you know, I mean, geoscientists can do a lot of things. Do you want to go look for dinosaurs or oil or gold or, or what? No, Coal? Sediment, what? You just want to go look for sedimentary rocks? They're all over outside. <laughs> I think people freak out um, because they don't really understand what we're doing. You know, it's what, we're, what Dana and I are doing is really not genetic engineering in the, in the sense that most people think about it. We're just 
attempting to switch genes on and switch genes off in, in one animal at a time. Right, we're, um, we're looking at each trait at a time also and trying to figure out the kinds of genetics it requires to convert, um, in one way to convert a trait back to an ancestral sort of trait and the but other... The, but the point is it's not scary. It's not scary. <laughs> we're working on the tail, so if we finally manage to get a chicken with a long tail, it will just be a chicken with a long tail. <laughs> but oh, chickens are dinosaurs, so it's a dinosaur with a long tail. <laughs> for, for the lab. <laughs> it's just pretty, no, pretty much a standard It's just, lab. you know... <laughs> Really what we're doing is just trying to modify a bird and just give it some characteristics that are more dinosaur-like than bird-like. And, and understand how evolution happened to get from an ancestral-type dinosaur to a bird. Indominus, well, the Indominus rex, it didn't actually start with a, a T-rex. It actually started with a thing called Therizinosaurus, which is a... Which is a really weird looking dinosaur with really long arms and big claws and that's what we started with and then we added a little t-rex and a little velociraptor and a bunch of other stuff including cuttlefish so it had some camouflage but you know indominus rex is a completely fictionalized dinosaur which makes it the most accurate dinosaur ever <laughs> in jurassic park <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was your favorite actor? My favorite actor? You mean that I met? Yeah. Well, Chris Pratt's a pretty cool guy. He was I really I like him. But they're all they're all all the actors in all the Jurassic Park movies have been really nice people. So I liked all of them. What? Those are Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's a question here. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, Wait. Oh, We've got, we have a little guy here. Great That's a question. great question. Yeah. That's the million dollar question. <laughs> he asked why if raptors were so smart, why they went extinct and birds didn't. And we don't know the answer to that. That's a darn good question. That's something you could, you know, you could just, maybe you could be a graduate student one day and figure that out. But, uh, but birds were actually flying at the same time that T-Rex was stomping around. So they already were flying, they had feathers. Could have been something to do with flight, maybe, or maybe the birds that you know, were divers or something, but they're trying to figure that out now. Yeah, there are person. some people that think they, it was because they ate seeds. And all the other food items may have died off, and seeds were still there, and birds ate seeds, and that's an interesting idea. I don't really care why they went extinct. Well, the behave behaviors that we can determine in, in dinosaurs are pretty simple. I mean, you can tell that they, you know, that they cared for their young because we have skeletons of young dinosaurs that couldn't leave their nest. Um, we also know that they were social because of the changes in the shape of the skulls as they grew up. But specific behaviors we do not know. I mean, obviously, we can't observe them like we do modern, mam modern animals. Make a real dinosaur? She will. <laughs> yes, absolutely. 
It's, it's amazing what scientists are capable of doing right now. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> we can, right now we can, we, you know, right now we have the capability of, cha of, of, of changing a bird's entire head to look like a velociraptor-like animal. Right, if that paper came out and, and leg-like structures of dinosaurs that they've made from birds have already come out, um, yeah, it's all been published. We, you know, it's yeah. We can get. We're pretty darn close already. It's the tail. It's the, the tail. The one tail. that I'm working on, which is the <laughs> hardest thing. So who decides when that would happen? Right. Well, there's so every everything that a scientist does at a university has to be approved at the national level. So there is a NIH level committee that has to approve everything that we do. So, and of course, ethics are... Except, except, we could hatch it. <laughs> yes, and you know... What? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just saying, it, you know, once the animal, once we have all the characteristics, we could just hatch the animal. And then you can decide, someone can decide whether it was a good idea or not, <laughs> right? It's kind of like making a chihuahua. Somebody had, somebody made a chihuahua and they probably didn't ask anybody's permission to do that. So are there countries that are, you know, even par with the work that you folks and your colleagues are doing that are governed by others? Actually, most of the work related to this is done here in the U.S. Yeah, it's all done here. It was, we were doing it, we were the only institution doing it for quite a while. Uh, uh, McGill University, we have colleagues there that they've been working on a lot of stuff as well, but just recently labs at Harvard and Yale have gotten pretty involved as well. When, when, when we were doing it by ourselves, everybody thought it was wacky science. And then, you know, when McGill University and Harvard and Yale got involved, then it wasn't wacky anymore. <laughs> right, and it turns out we're finding all these parallels to human disease <laughs> that we didn't realize. So there's actually amazing science that's been coming out of this project. And I think that's important to keep in mind. You know, this sci pure science like this is not, is, you know, we, we start with some weird questions and we always, in science, discover things that we didn't expect. And, Lots you know, things. that's the coolest thing about science. <laughs> so we heard that, um, that you're going to be retiring. Um, what's your next step in life? Uh, I'm just retiring from MSU. Um, but I'll still be emeritus here. And I've... I have a teaching position in California um, uh, where I'll be working with dyslexic kids and figuring out how to integrate kids with learning disabilities into colleges. Thank you. I'll still, I'll still do stuff with dinosaurs, but, and Dana's got to get her project done. <laughs> so I can have my pet dinosaur. <laughs> yep. Say that again. Oh, I can't really tell you that. <laughs> I can't tell you anything about the movie. It's always kept secret. There's, we, don't, we don't release any information about any of the movies before they come out. Yeah, you have to manipulate the bird when it's still inside the egg, absolutely. And so there are ways where you actually open up, you, you open up a little window into the egg and you can inject stuff into that embryo, you can infect it with viruses that give it certain genes which work in different places in the embryo. 
So it all happens within the egg. That's right. Good question. All right, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>